Hi, I'm Jason Moon of Bear Brook, and I'm this week's guest on Metapod. You're listening to Metapod, where we unpack the web's most interesting podcasts and the stories behind them, hosted by Wendy Morrill and Kevin May. So far, Metapod has talked to podcast hosts from Norway, England, Scotland, Germany, the Netherlands, Canada, and various parts of the US. That's not bad, eh? Not bad at all. What's what's a country that you'd really like to include on the list that's not there yet? Okay, uh, two if I can. So India or South Africa, and what about you, Wendy? I would say New Zealand and Japan. I'd, I'd like to hear some podcasts from those parts of the world. So Metapod listeners, send any suggestions you have. In the meantime, this week's guest is based in a place that's probably not top of mind for a lot of people, though once every four years the place gets some media attention thanks to the U.S. presidential primary elections there. Yep, we're crossing the pond again and heading to the region of New England in the northeast of the U.S., and more specifically, we're headed to the Granite State, the Live Free or Die State, or more locally, the 603. Do you know which state it is, Kev? It's Vermont, right? Nope, Kev. Nope. It's not Vermont. (laughs) New Hampshire. It's New Hampshire, which is the upside down one, right? (laughs) No, the upside down one is Vermont. But (laughs) we're close enough. So let's move on for the benefit of our audience. Our guest this week is Jason Moon, a reporter and producer at New Hampshire Public Radio. He's the creator and presenter of a podcast called Bear Brook. Bear Brook is about a decades-long investigation to identify four victims found in the mid-80s in the woods of New Hampshire. Bear Brook is also the name of the large, thickly wooded recreational park where these bodies were found. We also hear a bit of the story of the killer of these four victims. He was uh, later called the Chameleon. Uh, Bear Brook is a fascinating story for anyone interested in cases related to missing persons, identity, genetic genealogy and what forensic technologies mean for criminal investigations listeners of the death in ice valley episode of metapod which was uh, way back in episode two remember we us getting into the often controversial subject of dna databases this is actually a central part of the bear brook investigation as jason moon explains start the tape Jason, welcome to Metapod. Thank you for joining me and Kevin to talk about your podcast, Bear Brook. Thank you for having me. Great. Uh, You're tuned in from New Hampshire, I'm assuming. That's right, from Concord, New Hampshire, just a few minutes away from the station, New Hampshire Public Radio, where I used to go uh, to work. Um, But now my office is also my apartment, so that's where I'm calling you from today. Okay. Jason Moon headquarters then. Here we are. That's right, yes. So I grew up in New Hampshire, uh, or the 603, as some of us (laughs) like to call it. Um, And when Kevin and I actually started Metapod, I asked for recommendations from my friends uh, for the best podcast that they had listened to. And three people independently recommended Bear Brook. Um, They were all from New Hampshire. They all said, you absolutely have to listen to this and, and speak to Jason Moon if you can meet him. Um, one of them even said, I recommend this podcast for some local flavor. <laughs> and so obviously I went and, and listened to Bear Brook. I think I probably completely binged on it. Well, thank you. <laughs> and and then recommended it to Kevin. But um You don't need to be from New Hampshire to really enjoy this story and appreciate it. And I was wondering if you could start off by telling us who is this story about and why should you listen, even if you're not from the state of New Hampshire or even from the USA? Mm. Well, the story is about um, a set of the victims, um, four people uh, who were 
murdered and um, their bodies were found in the woods of New Hampshire. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, the story of a very unusual kind of, of cold case and that these people were a family, uh, a family of unidentified victims um, who, who stayed unidentified for decades, um, which is rare and interesting in and of itself. But what to me makes the story really worth telling is how it became uh, sort of ground zero for the use of new forensic techniques, um, most notably genetic genealogy, which many people will have heard of because of the Golden State Killer case. Mm -hmm. um, that technique really got off the ground with the Bear Brook case. And so if you want to understand sort of what's going on right now with the, the sort of, um, I guess, renaissance, for lack of a better word, of, of uh, cold cases being solved across the country right now with genetic genealogy, how that works, why some people are concerned about it, um, this, is, um, this is a podcast for you. You know, we with the tagline of that we used for the podcast was that this was a you know a murder investigation that was changing how murders would be investigated forever. It's true, and it's and it's playing out right now all across the country. Now, New Hampshire is probably an unlikely place for a technological first, and I say that as <laughs> someone who grew up in the state. Uh, you don't have to respond to that. <laughs> What's the international draw to this story? Or, you know, is there anything universal about this particular story or the techniques used in it? Certainly. I, yeah, I mean, I think in a couple of ways. I, I mean, I think anyone can relate to it or and be interested in, um, you know, finding out what happened to, to an entire family. Um, I think there's just the kind of inherent personal drama that's present in, in so many true crime stories. Um, but, you know, this technique, this forensic technique of genetic genealogy is, is, is by no means, um, you know, limited to the United States in its use. Um, you know, it's being used all over the world and in the commercial space, you know, with uh, 23andMe and Ancestry.com and, and those kinds of websites, but it's also being adapted for use by law enforcement agencies all across the world as well, because, of the really profound power it offers um, in terms of identification. Um, maybe we can get into that, why it's so powerful later, but, but it is, it's really a kind of game changer in terms of, um, you know, it's the, probably the most important new forensic technique that police have encountered in the last 30 years. Yeah, I think we will come back to the uh, techniques and technology in a moment. Um, I'm wondering, you know, because this is a story of victims that actually goes beyond the state of New Hampshire, in covering this story for the podcast, are there things that you surmised about America and its institutions mm -hmm. based on this story? Well, certainly there's a lot to, a lot I learned uh, and a lot to be said in the podcast, uh, a lot that is said in the podcast about the way our criminal justice system treats DNA as evidence, how law enforcement has traditionally used that as a tool, the guardrails that were placed around the use of that in law enforcement traditionally, how this new technique um, mm -hmm. really challenges those and the concerns that surround that. So there's definitely um, a lot to be said in that realm. I think also in a, in a more... I guess, cultural sort of way, you know, one of the big questions to me for the, this story and in the podcast is, is just how did this happen? How, you know, how can a family of four just yeah. go missing and no one seems to be looking for them? And I think I went into the story really kind of baffled and puzzled by that. And I think a lot of listeners probably begin listening like that. And for me, by the time I finished reporting the story, I no longer found it so surprising because of what I learned. And I think part of that has to do with a cultural moment of the 70s and 80s um, and a time, you know, before technologies that, you know, we take for granted today or that, or perhaps we take for granted how profoundly they shape our lives, you know, just a, the challenge for many of us many younger people like myself and imagining a world before, you know, text messaging and social media and how it could, you know, 
so easily or plausibly happen that a family just moves away and and people slowly lose touch over time and no one has any real reason to suspect foul play, but that's in fact what's happened. And unfortunately, there were people like Terry Rasmussen, who who is at the center of this case, who who intuited that and who took advantage of that and who made that sort of um, part of their MO, um, setting up victims to appear as though they wanted to go missing, that they wanted to mm-hmm. lose touch with their family and friends. And and we definitely see that pattern in the, in the story. And so that was a kind of education for me. You know, I'm not exactly sure what that says about our society or our, our culture, but it's given me a lot of food for thought over the years, for sure. There are a number of elements within this story where people are surprised at the delay in things so there's that surprise between the first set of barrels being discovered and Mm -hmm. you know the 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 second one and you know advances in science aside did it surprise you when you first started doing the story for new hampshire public radio that there was this incredibly long time period between the first people going missing and then being discovered and then the second group of bodies being discovered in some respects you think you know that's just unbelievable that there was this time lag absolutely yeah that i mean that was one of the f- first things that you know piqued my interest about the case was was i mean there's so much unusual about it but but that is one of the the main things that you know you have four victims but they were discovered 15 years apart yeah at the same site um that's that's pretty rare um not only did, was there that historical fact that I went into the case knowing, but then I kind of experienced my own version of that because when I first started reporting on the story, we didn't know a lot of the things that you know go in went into the final podcast. Ba- basically, yeah. if you've listened to Bear Brook, you know basically everything after episode three, you know hadn't happened when I was first uh, reporting on it and so I, and I even used to joke I tempted fate around the office because I was taking so long working on this story that I said well you know this is this case has been cold for 30 years it's not really <laughs> urgent that I finish the story it's still going to be unsolved <laughs> and then um and then it started to get solved there's a brilliant bit in the in one of the episodes and forgive me i can't remember which episode it is and it goes back to what you were just saying a moment ago jason about you know these um two groups of bodies found very close to each other you do this brilliant exercise i'm going to call it where you and your uh, producer verbally talk through the distance between Uh, yes and you know in some i'm interested from an editorial perspective why you did that because you know you could explain you know, it's a uh, length of a uh, American football field or something like that. Mm-hmm. But the fact that you trudge it out, you and your you and your producer, just to demonstrate it, and I wondered that it was it was a brilliant piece of broadcasting. And I suspect that's maybe your radio career coming through there. But why did you take that decision to do it? Because it works. But you know, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, well, well, I'm glad to hear that it worked. <laughs> um, it was a uh, it was controversial in the group edits. Uh, I'll tell you. Oh, okay. It um it, it was the, it, the idea first came from Taylor uh, Taylor Quimby, who was the senior yeah. producer on the show. The issue was that there was this 15 year gap between the first barrel being discovered, the second barrel being discovered. They were only 300 feet apart. They'd been in the woods all that time together. And the obvious kind of first question that arises is, well, why didn't police find the second barrel, yeah. um, you know, 15 years prior? The issue was that I, I hesitated to go down that road too hard because I didn't want to create a false impression that this was going to be a podcast that sort of evaluated or interrogated the effectiveness of the authorities' investigation. Yep. You know, it was that's not the kind of podcast we were making. Not that that isn't a you know, a a legitimate kind of podcast to make, you know, this was right around the time that um, in the, I think it was the first season of in the dark had just come out. And that's exactly what that podcast does. It examines how authorities bungled the investigation of a very famous cold case. And so I was aware and self-conscious about that. And so I kind of didn't know what to do about it. Um, And so in the, in the first draft of that episode, we kind of just skim right past it. You know, we, you know, we say it's been 15 years uh, and then we just kind of move on with the story and everyone yeah. in the group at it was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> we have to sort of at least pause on this idea for a little bit. Um, and so this, you know, 
the walking outside scene was was a kind of compromise, I, I guess. It was a way to spend some time exploring that idea, questioning why wasn't it found earlier, giving voice to the explanation that is given by authorities, you know, that, well, it's a wooded area and you can't see 300 feet, but also raising the very legitimate criticisms that they just missed it. And so, yeah, I mean, it was it was a great idea from Taylor. Just spend some time with the idea. We weren't just letting it go. We weren't giving police a free pass. Yeah. But at least to me, it felt like we also weren't creating an expectation that we were going to do this at every step of the investigation. You know, we weren't trying, we weren't trying to do our own kind of shadow investigation of the case, Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, I just think as a mechanism for storytelling, it covered quite a few things what you've just referenced there jason but also it gives you a sense of what the park is like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which you did verbally in the first episode or so mm -hmm. that just that just kind of for me maybe it's just me i don't know but you know for me that that was a really helpful kind of mechanism yeah i think we always say it but it's true that radio or podcasting is a visual medium and it, it is really yeah. helpful to have things to picture spaces to to inhabit as a listener uh, things to imagine and I think it also helped that when we went out there, we were actually both genuinely surprised by our experience of it. You know, the reactions that are on tape are are genuine. I was really surprised at how kind of hard it was for us to find each other, like two people shouting at each other in the woods. Yeah. 300 feet away, you would think, I mean, maybe we were, we were just both particularly bad at it, but we, we had a hard time <laughs> finding each other. Um, and, and that did kind of, you know, it put a different, uh, you know, shade of thought on that whole sort of controversy about how egregious was it that they missed the first barrel. Yeah. And I think that's all we wanted to do. We wanted to let people make up their own mind, but, you know, explore the, the different uh, explanations for what happened. I think another nice demonstration that you made is your 23andMe DNA sample. Um, we hear you spitting and then later um, you and... Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> you and your colleague are reviewing your results. Apparently you're part Neanderthal. Yes. I was wondering if you've met up with that part of the family yet. No, they haven't reached out yet. <laughs> Next podcast, maybe? Yeah, season two. All right. Well, I think that this part actually comes after, maybe I have that wrong, a moment where you sort of go into the ethical decision that we all have about whether to submit our DNA to these commercial platforms like Ancestry.com and 23andMe. You talk to Barbara Ray mm -hmm. Venter. Um, I'm going to call her the rock star genetic <laughs> genealogist here. Um, and she kind of even makes a plea as to why you should do this. I'm assuming, you know, you chose to talk about your decision to do this a bit on the podcast for a reason. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. We, we you know, first and foremost, just wanted to demonstrate, you know, what it's like to, to take one of these tests, um, you know, just kind of give people a sense of, of what you see when you get your results back and sit down at the computer. And then for people who've done that, uh, which is a lot of people, we wanted to, you know, underscore the connection between that thing, which is very, you know, commercial and mm -hmm. and mundane in a way and kind of silly even, is is connected to the very sober, serious stuff of this story. You know, we wanted to connect that Christmas present you got for grandma last year <laughs> to uh, solving decades old cold cases like this, because that is, that's what's happening. That's, that's the truth. You know, we wanted to connect that up for people. Once we decided we wanted to do that, then there was really only one choice for whose DNA we were going to put in the tube. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that was the, the hazards of being a, a podcast host about genetic genealogy, I guess you can't really get away without testing your, your DNA. That said, I did not engage with the results of that okay. DNA test other than that time we taped it. Okay. I actually have um, little interest in it myself personally, which is maybe um, people might find ironic, but yeah, I, I, I mainly saw it as a, as a storytelling tool and technique and mm -hmm. not something that personally interests me very much at all. I mean, your job as a reporter with these types of tools becoming available and to more and more people, does that make it more 
difficult for you? I'm, I'm thinking about my own experience having done this and actually d discovering hmm. this piece of the family we didn't really know existed. And, you know, from that point on, my mom just believes I go into this website and answer her questions. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, it's, it's just there now that mm -hmm. all the answers mm -hmm. that none of us actually knew we had to ask questions mm -hmm. about are there. I would assume that that affects, you know, criminal investigations and how people tell their story. Mm. In terms of people thinking that it's easier to solve these kinds of things now than, than it actually is? or As a tool that's sort of changing the pace of how people know things about They're, their yeah. family or their connections with people, how, how do you deal with that as a storyteller or investigative mm. reporter? I mean, you know, so far all I've done is tell a story about that. You know, <laughs> I think that it's something worth... Um, pointing out as you just did that that it is very different and it's profound you know what you just described it, it is a new world we live in where you know not to be too cute about it but things that could not be known before can now be known and that is you know from the family secret all the way on up to you know who's responsible for heinous crimes and murders to me that's kind of what bear brook is about in a sense is that we now have access to a whole new field of answers and clearly there are ways in which you know those answers can bring peace and closure and and resolution if not justice to some people, you know, there's also potential for abuse. You know, I definitely wanted people to be left with that question at the end of the podcast that, wow, here's this really powerful new technology. I just got a demonstration of what it can do in a context that I think most people would agree was a good thing solving, uh, you know, a decades old murder case, but I didn't want it to be that simple for people. I wanted them to think about or be confronted with the question of, well, what else could it be used for? And would I endorse all of those other uses too? And, and so what, what is this going to do to us, you know, as a society, as a, you know, what is it going to do to our, our criminal justice system, our laws about, you know, who owns my DNA? Is it me or is it my brother? Because we both own half of each other's DNA. I wanted to, to raise all those questions for people and, and, and kind of leave them churning. I, I think what's really interesting, we interviewed a Norwegian journalist, you may have heard of her, Mara Tigroff from NRK. Mm. And she was the co-host of a BBC podcast called Death in Ice Valley, which was about a body that was found in a forest in a, a town called Bergen in Norway. They were in the same kind of situation, except their investigation or the police's investigation was unable to use these types of mm. services because of Norwegian laws. Mm. And there is a case going through the Norwegian courts and has been for the best part of 18 months about whether to allow the police to use commercial databases. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And I, I think what's, what is interesting is that, you know, the US has gone you know, embraced it. It's great. Let's, you know, it's helping us solve all these cold cases and connect people in weird and wonderful ways. Mm -hmm. There are other countries that have taken a, a completely different view to it. Yeah. That's more of a comment than a question, I guess, but an interesting one. Yeah. Well, no, it's interesting to see. Yeah. And um, yeah. if, if we can kind of change, uh, change tack a little bit, I mean, you met some interesting, I guess, characters in inverted commas along the way. I mean, one of the ones that, uh, <laughs> who I found very charming and very interesting was the, the cop that said goofy all the time everything was goofy and everything mm. and, and I, I i i sensed in your yeah in your narration of the podcast that in its entirety that you seem to warm to some of your interviewees more than others <laughs> how does that kind of how do you kind of go through that i mean is it your natural kind of personality that you kind of seem to get on with some others than or is it more about what you're actually talking about if that makes sense yeah, that's a good question because it gets at the at the space where the podcast storytelling, what you might call the art yep. of it, meets with the journalism of it. Those things can obviously can complement each other, but can also come into conflict with each other. And so it's always a kind of a fine line, a dance between those two things. One of the things I learned about you know working in long form, being a you know a host of a of a story that you're going to be taking listeners on for this long, was that I had to sort of show parts of myself. It was kind of a hard thing at first in the, in the first drafts, you know, that was one of the key pieces of feedback I got in the group edits was just like kind of, who are you? And like, why are you the person telling us this story? And like, you know, sort of what are your credentials? 
you know, not in a formal way, but um, people need to know something about their narrator in, mm -hmm. in these kinds of stories. We, you know, tried to do that with a really light touch throughout, you know, in the first episode that it means, you know, there's a couple paragraphs where I just kind of explicitly tell you who I am, what I was doing, why I got interested in the case. And then throughout, you know, we wanted to weave in the kind of natural rhythms and narrative of the reporting process. And so I think with the interview with Roxanne, you know, we talk about how traveled some distance to go see her. It was, you know, a ferry ride and she just moved into her house and she set yeah. up, you know, some lawn chairs in an empty room. And, you know, we're using those using those moments in a couple of ways, you know, for for one, we are giving our listener a sense of space and place and like we were talking about earlier, something to imagine. So, you know, you can kind of see me and Roxanne sitting in these lawn chairs, you know, the rain, you can hear softly outside the window. That's, we've created a moment, we've created a scene, even though we're just sitting down for an interview. And that's, um, you know, one of the things that's tricky, but also really powerful about, you know, long form audio storytelling is that you need scenes to get you through the story, to propel the narrative. You need to take your listener into places. My sort of personal reactions or, or takes on people were sort of, you know, weaved into those moments so that you could sort of imagine me in that scene because you know who I am as a character. Now I'm in a place. And then I establish uh, Roxanne as a character by talking about how she says goofy yeah. a lot. <laughs> You know, often what we're doing is we're doing narrative work on the front end that we're going to get a payout on later. So when we introduce Roxanne and we point out how she says goofy as a way to describe these, all these crazy things she's seen as a cop over many decades, yeah. you know, that sets you up for, you know, 20, 25 minutes later when she's describing coming across the scene of uh, uh, Unsun Jun's remains and she uses the word goofy in that phrase and suddenly yeah. it's imbued with all this extra meaning because you know that that word is an important word for Roxanne and the way she says it in that scene and the history that you've had with her makes that moment more powerful so but you know we're often trying to get people to invest in moments characters so that later moments yeah. will feel more powerful yeah, it's just good production and good narration, if nothing else, you know. Well, thank you. <laughs> but I, I, another editorial thing that I'm very curious about, and I said to I said to Wendy when we were chatting last week about the this interview today that this this one I found perhaps the most fascinating element. I mean, I've been a journalist for 25 years and understand often where you can and can't go with things. And in one of the later episodes, you talk about the owner of the campground. Yeah. Yeah. And how close he was to the killer. And there are a lot of unanswered questions. And also that he declined to be interviewed for the podcast. You know? yeah. And there is a one hell of a lot of implication in the way that's told that there is a, a connection that may have a little bit more substance to it. Mm -hmm. Now, here in the UK, we have various things around media law and libel mm -hmm. law and all those kind of things. And I'm absolutely fascinating you know, there are people that are listening to this episode who may have listened to bear brook and there'll be those that haven't so i'm trying not to give too much away but i'm i'm really curious about that editorial process that you went through to imply that part of the story or not does that make sense yes uh we had many yeah quite a few conversations about this um and you know Ultimately, what we, I mean, we were torn about it. I, I was torn about yeah. it. I, frankly, I still am not, you know, 100% sure that we made the right decision. I, I, although I can't quite imagine what else we would have done, um, you know, I really just wish that we had had a chance to talk to him. Um, right, most of all. yeah. Yeah. Um, but what we decided to do was, was to try to show that conflict uh, you know, uh, about our, about our decision. And so, you know, the way we wrote that, that section is um, we kind of laid out both sides of, of the argument yeah. of like, what, should I mention this? Should I not? Here's the reasons I maybe shouldn't. Here's the reasons why I am going to. And I, I think for me, what pushed me over the edge was, was just thinking about if we didn't put it in, I think it would have felt dishonest to me which is, you know, it's an incredibly subjective thing. 
in some ways. The other thing that helped us decide whether or not to go down this road was the fact that we, we had tape of one of the lead investigators at the major crime unit for the state of New Hampshire, essentially clearing this guy's name in a phone yeah. interview with me. And so that made us feel a bit more comfortable in terms of, you know, well, there are these questions, but officially, as far as authorities are concerned, he's, you know, he's got a clean bill of health. And so that was a factor as well. But again, it's, it's one of those, it's one of those calls that is really, um, there's not an easy up or down yeah. way to figure it out. I, I imagine New Hampshire Public Radio's editorial lawyer and his or her money for that day when you had those meetings. Anyway, yes, we, we that's what we we love having that support. Yes, <laughs> I, you need an annual fundraiser mm. for public radio. That's right. One of these nice little details that shows a little bit about you that you weren't afraid to leave in. You're speaking to. Diane, I believe it is, the, the daughter of Terry Rasmussen, and she describes the visit he makes in Arizona with an unknown woman who has bouncy but not Farrah Fawcett hair. <laughs> you leave in this little bit where she doubts whether you know what that means or not, if I'm detecting that right. And I, yes. I wondered, is that a sort of worry on her part that you're young and might not know who that is? And I mean, my question is not how old are you, but how has it been um, received with you approaching people to talk um, about the case for a podcast? You know, this new medium that maybe people don't even understand or know about. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. I, I have I forgot about that tape. I haven't thought about that tape maybe since we put that episode together. <laughs> Um, but yes, that is definitely what she was. She was like, maybe you don't know who Farrah Fawcett is. Um, but yes, in terms of approaching people, you know, uh, and saying I'm doing a podcast. Well, first of all, a lot of the interviews were done before I knew we were going to do a podcast about it. So uh, that um, simplified that to some extent. And, you know, there's definitely a bit of, uh, I guess, tactics that we will employ when we're when we're making those first uh, requests for interviews with people you know do we stress that we're from New Hampshire Public Radio or the local NPR station or do we talk about that this we're working on a long form serialized podcast yeah. and you know we're making assumptions about whether what people will know about what people will um you know, because often you only have, you know, one email or one 20 seconds on a phone call to, to get people to believe that you're legitimate and trust you and want to talk to you. And so, yeah, there's a lot of wordsmithing sometimes about what are the first five words I need to cut out of my mouth yeah. to get this person to respond to me. That's, you know, even harder when you're doing this kind of story where, you know, for a lot of the sources, the subject matter is, is deeply personal and painful. Yeah. and traumatic and you know what we're asking them to do in some cases you know to relive that is um is a lot to ask mm -hmm. and uh, and we wanted to be sensitive about that and um you know and in, the, in those cases you know generally we wanted we wanted to impress upon them that the reason we were reaching out to them was so that you know their relatives could be um, you know, more fully realized in the story as a, as a person, as a human with, you know, a history and agency rather than, you know, simply a victim or, you know, just some event in the life of a, of a serial killer, you know, that, that kind of thing, which I, you know, the, the, all the kind of pitfalls that a lot of true crime falls into, you know, we were, we wanted to signal to people as much as we could that we were aware of, of those and didn't want to, perpetuate them. So just like New Hampshire being an unlikely place for first technologies to be applied in <laughs> DNA forensic um, investigation, you've also broken new ground at New Hampshire Public Radio with long form storytelling. Mm. And I understood that this podcast actually started through an innovation fund. It's complicated. Um, but the the short of it is is that to do Bear Brook, we kind of had to um it was a process of scavenging. You know, I was the education reporter when I first started on Bear Brook. Um and I was filing what we call newscast items, you know, 30, 45 second stories, 
you know, on a daily basis and was trying to do this podcast basically on nights and weekends. And then that, that went on for a couple of years. In fact, um, it was more than two years before we kind of got serious about it. And some people shuffled around to backfill for me. I was given six months full time to work on it, which was a huge mm -hmm. gift. And I got support in uh, producer Taylor Quimby, who became a really integral part of the production process. And, um, you know, six months later, we produced this, you know, what, what is, is now, you know, the most listened to thing that New Hampshire Public Radio has ever produced. And so then that led to a second set of questions, which was, well, hmm, maybe we should do something like that again. Uh, and then we did with um, a very different kind of podcast. It was still narrative, but it was um, uh, focused on the, the presidential primary, which is, you know, the, the one thing that kind of makes New Hampshire of, of national note every four years anyways. And we were able to do that. But again, it, it required, you know, pulling people off their normal duties. And, um, you know, we lost a lot of hair over it. And it just, it, they're just a really labor intensive projects, incredibly labor intensive to do these things. Finally, just this year, in fact, we, we've now created a, a new part of our newsroom that um, at the moment is is me and one other colleague, Lauren Trulgen. This is now, you know, our entire responsibility is is just to find and tell long form stories. And it is for a small public radio station with a newsroom of about 10 people it is definitely a leap of faith. It's a risk. It is not, you know, traditionally what small public radio stations have done. All that being said, there is a growing sense not just at NHPR, but across the whole public radio system, that this is kind of the future for how, you know, small uh, stations stay relevant because you kind of get deep down into the public radio politics of it all. But it used to be that small public radio stations existed to be a conduit for content from national public radio. Yeah. Yeah. We don't need small stations to get NPR anymore, right? There are podcasts, there's the internet, there's satellite radio. What people do need though is local journalism and newspapers of course are folding left and right. There's a lot of talent out there that, um, you know, has been laid off and people are hungry for in-depth, you know, reporting about their own community. And so, you know, that's what we want to do and, and to tell stories, you know, about a local community that are of interest to people anywhere. You know, I think, and, and Bearbrook and, and we, Stranglehold, I think, also accomplishes that in that you don't have to be from New Hampshire to be fascinated by these things, but they take place here. Mm -hmm. And I think probably anywhere you go in the country or in the world, you know, there are a number of stories in, in that corner of the world that would be interesting to anyone anywhere that could hold a, a multi-part podcast series, at least that's what we're hoping. <laughs> we're hoping there are more than just one. So anyways, that's a long way to answer um, kind of what we're, what we're trying to, to do at, at New Hampshire Public Radio. I think it's, it's remarkable and that your team has done an amazing job. I, Thank you. I also wonder um, if you feel constrained in any way, knowing that you're trying to create uh, for the local community. Yeah. It, yes, it's certainly a constraint on the kinds of stories we can do. You know, maybe we find a great story and then it leads us to the source, you know, says this all happened in Philadelphia. And then we're kind of like, ah, I guess we can't do that one. You know, that being said, I think it's, I think it's actually okay in terms, just from a creative perspective, it's good to have some constraints on, you know, like I can't imagine anything more terrifying than being told like, you can do any story anywhere in the world, go, <laughs> you know, like I would be paralyzed. <laughs> um, so sure. It's frustrating at times that we, you know, we kind of, there are some like big, big story, like, uh, or big thematic topics that are kind of hard to get at in, in a story that's set in New Hampshire. You know, I, I mean, uh, you know, it'd be hard to tell a story about, you know, um, you know, urban lifestyle or, or, you know, architectural design in New Hampshire, you know, just as a bad example. So there are kind of those, those sorts of limitations, but there's a flip side to that, which is that, you know, most of the journalism firepower of the world is concentrated in big cities and podcasting is especially that way, which I think is a real shame. On the other hand, it, it creates opportunities for me because, you know, there might be 
70 people making podcasts at, at Gimlet or WNYC, but there are two people making long form podcasts in New Hampshire. Yeah. Um, uh, and I'm one of them. Yeah. Do you feel constrained in the pace or yeah. tone that you might need to take in New <laughs> Hampshire? Or No, I, I don't know. And in terms of when we think of our audience, we want it to be accessible to a national audience. So we don't assume geographic knowledge or anything like that. We, you know, we want it, we want it to, on the other hand, we don't want to alienate our New Hampshire audience. You know, we, we want it to make sense to people from New Hampshire why we're telling this story, but we, we don't ever want that to be a barrier to entry. You don't need to turn it on and, and be, um, um, need to be familiar with anything about the state or anything like that to be able to, to get something from it. Amen to almost everything that you've been saying. Anyone who champions oh, lo local journalism, I did my stint in local journalism many years ago and I loved every second of it. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm interested if we can. I mean, many true crime podcasts often try to delve very deeply into the reasons why the perpetrator did what they did. Yeah. You know, they'll get criminologists on and social psychologists and et cetera, et cetera, to give their their kind of analysis of it. I mean, Bear Brook is very, and I think commendably very factual. Thank you. And I wonder whether that was a, a deliberate, was it a deliberate decision? I, I know you talk a bit about Rasmussen's military history and stuff like that. I just wonder, was it a deliberate editorial decision not to try and unpack his potential motivations for what he did to commit those horrendous crimes? Yes, it was. It was. Um, it's funny to say this now, but for a long time, I, I didn't really admit to myself or even describe it to others as a true crime story. Okay. Because I was kind of self-conscious about that moniker because of, you know, personally, I, I'm not the biggest true crime fan because of some of the things you were just describing where, um, yep. You know, there, there can be a kind of perhaps unhealthy fascination with, um, you know, the perpetrator of crimes, uh, wondering why they did things. And and then the story becomes their story. And then the victims become events in that person's life, you know, which we were talking about before. Yeah, so we, we, I very much wanted to avoid that. And that was very much on my mind uh, the whole the whole time as, as we did the as we did the podcast. And so, yeah, it, it kind of, it guided a lot of our decisions, but it was there from the beginning that we didn't want to make this, you know, we didn't, we could have called this, you know, the chameleon, you know, yeah, uh, and done the six part podcast series about Terry Rasmussen. Yeah. But we didn't. Yeah. yeah that's a very good point. I mean, and uh, I, I, I've, I've read this before and heard things about this. I mean, often, often many reporters, investigative journalists etc have noted that you know by the time they get to the end of a story that they've been working on for a long time especially one that kind of unravels and discovers things that you know initially they feel quite elated that we've got to the end of the story and they've mm -hmm. you know we've we've produced this amazing body of work but then there's this bit of a almost like a, a kind of a mental gap because they've got no the, the story is finished and it's almost like they have a a, a, a yearning to find out more information. I mean, did you, hmm. so the, the, the question is um, in a much shorter way to say, did you feel elated and quite relieved that it was all over or were you kind of, I wish there was another kind of element to this story that we could, I know there've been updates with kind of yeah. when police have done press conferences, but you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's not, it's not uh, I'm not saying that I, you would have felt like that, but you know what I mean? Yeah, I understand that that impulse. I mean, I think that's why a lot of us, you know, like to be reporters. You know, as we we enjoy the kind of yeah. the thrill of the hunt, for lack of better phrase, of you know, finding out new information. That said, I think with this story in particular, I w I was by and large uh, relieved. Yeah, w you know, when when um, you know, and it's still it's still not entirely wrapped up. Uh, there's still you know one victim yeah. who who remains unidentified. But you know, when we got the three names, um, you know, there was there was a funeral which I attended. There was the family came to New Hampshire. There were there were all kinds of um, sort of acts of closure yeah. that were happening. And as a journalist covering them, I think they also kind of rubbed off on me. At a certain point, it felt to me like well we've really kind of accomplished almost everything we wanted to with the story, which was, you know, all the big questions have been answered. We, we thoroughly explored the promise and peril of genetic genealogy. 
We now have um, most of the identities of the victims, which was kind of the driving question of the story. And so, you know, there was a moment, you know, after we published the seventh episode where we were wondering, should we keep going? I mean, we could, the, the family of, um, of, the, of the victims in Bear Brook, you know, we, we really didn't spend too much time with them. We could explore their history and learn more about, you know, what led up to the initial crime. Yeah. But ultimately, we just, we just decided that now that we know who they were and, and have identities granted to them, they kind of, they don't really owe us anything else. Do you know what I mean? Like we they yeah. have a right to be private people again at, at that point, I think. You know, just because they were murder victims doesn't mean then it's okay for us to sort of plumb the depths of their family history and, and whatever um, events may have led up to that moment. I think to the extent that they were victims in a case that that was of national interest that symbolized a lot of things, you know, it was something worth reporting on. I think once once they have names, then they become, to me anyways, like any other private citizen. And I think the, the reporting value, the news value of kind of going deep on their backgrounds was no longer there for us. And so we just decided to, you know, let it be at yeah. that point. Interesting. To go a little bit further with that, some other podcasts are really involving listeners in crowdsourcing for tips and leads and mm. this sort of thing. Um, I don't think that's something you, you chose to do in this case, um, mm -hmm. though it doesn't mean that you probably haven't received information like that. <laughs> Any thoughts on that yeah. approach in podcasts related to crimes? Yeah, I think it's a really, it's an interesting territory and it's something that we try to, um, it, you know, it's one of, the, I guess you could call it one of the lesser uh, goals of, of Bear Brook was to sort of explore the world of you know, web sleuthery and, and amateur mm -hmm. investigations, you know, there's Rhonda Randall, there's uh, Becky Heath. It was important for us, though, as uh, journalists uh, in the process that that we were not involved in the process of, um, of, of solving the case ourselves. You know, that was not our goal, which um, it might sound callous to people, but it's, and it's not that we didn't want the case to be solved, but it's just an important distinction in terms of, you know, creating journalistic distance between us and the people who are trying to solve it so that I'm not on the same team as Rhonda Randall necessarily or yeah. Becky Heath. I want to cover what they're doing and to do that in a journalistically sound way, I need to not be doing it along with them or doing the same thing as them. Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, I, I don't, I'm don't. i not personally opposed to other podcasts um, you know, kind of engaging in that kind of work. I think it's just important that you create an expectation with listeners at the outset that that's what you're doing. And so you understand that this is a podcast, it's, you know, that, that has, has these kinds of aims and these, and these kinds of goals. And we wanted to be transparent in, in our storytelling that we were reporting on the effort to solve the investigation. We were not trying to solve it ourselves. And I, th I think that's an important yeah. distinction that you just need to let your listeners know about um, up front. You also let listeners know that you created a, a bit of the music or a lot of the music for this particular podcast. Yes. Yeah. Can we expect to hear more music from you in future podcasts? <laughs> I know people who want to know. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's my hope. Yes. Um, I um, <laughs> Every couple of weeks or months, I, I will listen to um, a new podcast. And, I, you know, I try to keep up on what our, our peers are doing, you know, steal mm -hmm. tips and tricks from them. And uh, every time I hear one of the same beds, music beds that we used in Bear Brook, because while most of the music was original, not all of it was. Mm -hmm. So every time I hear one of the beds <laughs> we used in Bear Brook in someone else's podcast, it just... <laughs> It just irks me a little bit, and it's it's not their fault, you know. We we both are accessing the same bank of music, but it just it pushes me to want to create more original scoring for our pieces because it can be so important just in creating you know the sound of a podcast that is unique. There's always the danger, especially in public radio, I think, of becoming a caricature of yourself. That's to some extent already happening in in serialized podcasting with music choice and you know how 
um, I think I can't remember who who wrote this, but um, or who said this to me, but a lot of podcasts now they all sound kind of plinky plunky. All of the music is sort of you know violin strings plucked and, and marimbas played, and it's sort of um, I think at a certain point the kind of the sameness of of all the podcasts starts to hurt all of the podcasts, and so yes. A long way of saying yes. We're uh, working on new stuff for for new projects now, and as much as we can, kind of step out of that stream of same music and podcasts, we will try to do so. But it's a lot of work, I must say. It's a lot of work on top of the reporting, and yeah, so it's not always hard, easy to find time to do it. That's kind of the problem. Yeah. Do you think that's a space where? musicians can move into now i mean there's quite a lot of musicians not on the road right now yes that would be yeah that'd be great i mean blue dot sessions is kind of the leader in that space they've they've really they sensed that opportunity early on and have really gone all in on on this i would love for there to be yeah more options you know we need the blue dot competitor we need the yellow dot or whatever it may be <laughs> okay um, thank you so much, Happy to do it. Jason Moon of Bearbrook Podcast, for joining us. That was uh, really terrific. We've learned so much, and the listeners, as I say, that haven't listened to the podcast, I'm sure they'll be quite inspired to go and get the full and unraveled story from you, Jason. So once again, from us at Metapod, thank you very much for joining us. Happy to do it. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. So you know how I joked with Jason that New Hampshire is an unlikely place for a technological first? Yeah. Well, that wasn't totally fair of me because there's actually a pretty interesting innovation that came from the state. Okay, tell us. What is it? The Segway. You know, the self-balancing personal transporter. <laughs> that funny looking thing with two chunky wheels. We used to have them here in Amsterdam for uh, small group tours around the city. Well, the Segway was developed in New Hampshire by a guy named Dean Kamen. Right, now, have you ever used one, first of all? And does everyone in New Hampshire... <laughs> Does everyone in New Hampshire drive around in them? No, and no. I, you don't know how I wish I could say yes, though. <laughs> but get this, because Dean Kamen is a serial inventor, he's still at it in New Hampshire. His latest venture is engineering and manufacturing human organs. Well, I Okay, so better to be a serial inventor of things that bring life than a serial killer, right? <laughs> For Metapolis, this is just a joke too far. Anyway. Well, aside from all that great science and tech in New Hampshire, we should give a shout out to Jason Moon and his colleagues, as well as the supporters of New Hampshire Public Radio for investing in local and long form journalism in hurrah. the state at the station. Yeah, hurrah. We wish them well with their new project, and uh, I expect they'll be pretty well received with that, if Bear Brook is any indicator. If you're interested in the new project Jason mentioned in our interview, it's called Document at New Hampshire Public Radio, and you can check that out on Twitter at NHPRDocument or nhpr.org. You can find more information about the Bearbrook podcast, including its original music, transcripts, timelines related to the uh, case at bearbrookpodcast.com. You can find the podcast also on Twitter, which is at bearbrookpod. As always, you can find all the links we mention here on Metapod on our website. So, Kev, tell us what's coming next week. Yeah, so next week... Emily Strasser, narrator of The Bomb, is featured on Metapod. Uh, the Bomb is a seven-episode story produced by the BBC World Service about the development of the atomic bomb and one of the scientists closely involved, that's Leo Szilard. Emily has a family connection to the story, and we talked to her about that and a few other things uh, like climate change. All right, that sounds pretty good. So uh, that's it from us for now. And we'll see you next time. That's it for Metapod this time. Thanks for listening. Metapod will be back soon with another unpacking of the web's most interesting podcasts. But in the meantime, make sure to subscribe at any of the usual places you find your other favourite podcasts. We'd hate for you to miss upcoming episodes, and we'd love it if you left us a review. You can let us know what you think of this episode by going to metapodshow.com. We'll see you next time.
Metapod is produced by Wendy Morrill and Kevin May. 